most successful films are where you focus on a story about the building rather than a really sort of pragmatic slideshow that's more of a tour of the building. Episode 171. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I am speaking again with the fabulous Jim Stevenson, who is an architectural photographer and filmmaker based here in the UK, and he's working worldwide. He's got an incredible portfolio of work. He's worked with some of the premier leading architects around the world. He's worked with David Ajay, some fantastic photographs of him there. He's worked with Gianni Botsford. He's taken pictures with London Studio Weave. There is just an enormous uh, array of projects that he has done. Warmer Yard photograph uh, photographs are fantastic. Beautiful film of the Macallan RSHP. The list is endless. And it was a real great pleasure to sit with Jim and talk about the power of architectural filmmaking in creating versatile marketing collateral. So Jim and I discussed how he works with architectural clients, the process that they'll go through in crafting a narrative for a film, the different places that film and video work can be used from social media to websites to actually having premieres of your films and inviting them as a as a, a, a you know pretty glamorous event and we talk about his process and the way that he likes to think about architecture on film and how we can use it to add to our repertoire of marketing abilities so sit back relax and enjoy jim stevenson this podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Jim, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? All good, yeah. Thanks for having me. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. I'm very well. Good to be speaking with you again. Now, yeah. you are one of the premier architectural photography photographers and video makers in the UK. You've got like the most extraordinary portfolio of work with you know you've taken pictures of work from Peter Zimthor to Acme to all sorts of multi-talented architects um, and you've made some beautiful films and you've recently launched uh, a relatively new endeavor Stevenson and Son when you're collaborating with architects on architectural film and in this conversation we were going to discuss exactly that the power of architectural videography and film in producing marketing collateral and kind of um, promoting promoting your work as a, as a practice. So yeah. I guess the first yeah. question is, what's the advantage of, of film? How, what, is, what are you seeing its place in, in architectural marketing at the moment? How has, it start, how has it evolved over the last few years? I think when you're, you have to be thinking about who your audience is and how that story might be received by different members of the audience. So sometimes it might be that a body of text is the best way to tell that or a series of photographs, mm -hmm. but other times it might be a video the, or a film. The benefit of a film is that it's a self-contained piece of story. So uh, whereas photographs, when you put them out there, get broken up and one gets put on Instagram and another one gets on the front cover of a magazine and the others are distributed throughout the magazine. With a film, it's a, a single self-contained thing. So you can really control how that story is being told and what story is being told as well. So it has a, a number of benefits over photographs. Photographs have their own benefits, of course, as well. Um, but it's becoming more and more popular basically because it's become more and more accessible now it's not a mm -hmm. it's not something you need a, a whole grand designs crew coming over to you know it's a it's a much simpler thing to to produce these days when do you know that using film is the right when is the right time to use film like when in a when in an architectural project does it work is it kind of you know we see a lot of the kind of old the, the kind of genre of architectural filmmaking and 
beautiful panoramic shots and the mist rising and you know kind of light gently uh, um like when do we know that it's the right time to to be using or telling a story like that through through film because i suppose the, the, the when you think about it it can be quite a daunting task yeah i mean it can be a daunting task because most of us have never made a film before like mm-hmm. most architects haven't made a film i mean maybe at university uh, you know a couple but most haven't so and anything like that is, is is pretty daunting i think there's two decision points really where when you make those decisions the first one is 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 there a film to be made in the first place and i think the way you make that decision is if you're taught if you find yourself talking about the project with uh people outside of your practice or people in in your practice and they're interested in what you're saying then maybe there's a film there um, because you know photographs can tell that story but if you've got a film there you can talk about it you can you can highlight some of those stories that perhaps uh, um, you know might go missed in, in a set of photographs possibly so that's the first thing if you think there's something interesting and engaging there um, and then the second decision is, is when do you start filming and I think that that can begin as mm. soon as uh, I mean it's most commonly for the work I do it tends to be when the project's finished similar to photography right. but there has been like you know there's been a rise in the last sort of five eight ten years of people wanting to show the progression of a project and the construction phases and the design phases so video can start right at the beginning of that really and you what you end up making more then is is a kind of mini documentary Mm -hmm. about the process of making a building and then you end with this sort of lovely third act on on the building being finished and and used and uh, interacted with could you give us some examples of when you've worked with clients where the the films have been particularly successful and like what what sorts of things did they have in place or did they get right in, in terms of their direction and brief that made the film you know a, a powerful market, piece of marketing collateral I think it's when they've had I think the most successful films are when the client has got a story that they want to tell or maybe two or three stories that they want to tell about the building but they're not trying to cram everything in i think the, the best films yeah. are where you know you, you what normally happens is i normally have a meeting with with the with the architect beforehand and that can be months before sometimes or it can be you know a, a few weeks before and we talk about what the key aspects of the project are and that's a long list because you could make i always say that you you know you can make a a, a six part BBC series about any building, about the life of any building, um, or you can make a feature length, two hour, three hour film about any building. Most of the time, mostly because of budget, what you're really looking to do is make a five minute, 10 minute film about the building. So you've yeah. got to sort of narrow your story down. So the, the most successful ones is when the, when the client is, is, is able to do that and is comfortable doing that, narrowing the story down a bit to maybe sort of two or three key, uh, t- key sort of pillars that you build the whole story around. And then I, for me personally, I think the best films are when you sort of try, you hear, you might hear that if there is voices in it, there are, if there are interviews in it, you might hear the architect's voice or somebody from the design team, of course. But then you also try to tell the story through the people that use the building as well. So you have their voice or you show them using the space or a mixture of, of both, ideally. But I think that's when it works best, when you've got a sort of clear idea of the story and then the building and then you're telling the story through uh, the people that use it. Mm. I think, sort of conversely, where film um, sort of trips up a little bit is when you fall into the temptation of, of actually just doing a building tour, which, um, you know, sometimes that's, uh, you know, that might be the right response to something, but it rarely is, to be honest, because the temptation is to treat a film as a slideshow, as if you were giving a lecture about the film, about the building, sorry, or as if you were giving a building tour and here's the front door and now here's the lobby and now here's the next part of the building, now here's the next part. And we know, like when you go on a building tour in real life, you don't go home and tell people what it was like, what the front door was like and what the and what the, ne- the different transitions of spaces are like. You tell people about the story that you learned from the tour guide. Mm. So really these, the, the most successful films are where you focus on a story about the building rather than uh, a really sort of pragmatic slideshow that is a um, that's more of a tour of the building that's a, that's a very interesting distinction to make because you know one one is kind of like the real estate 
uh, agent mm. showing you off the building and here's this space and the, the sizes of it and it's kind of like a superficial um, yeah. cosmetic you know experience of the building versus the thought that goes behind it the like like you say the, the the characters and the people that are using the building and the the processes that are involved in the practice to conjure yeah. up the ideas or the or the strategy behind the building and um, well last time we spoke one of the times we spoke previously we, we had a very interesting conversation around you know people in photography um and, and you're and you're saying here as well that actually kind of being able to tell the stories of the people that use the building actually this gives it another dimension another another richness how would you suggest that architects kind of navigate that and what should they be thinking about with you know having people in the in the in the films well it's interesting isn't it it is entirely it is entirely possible to make a narrative storytelling film without having people in right um, i think you in that case you end up focusing more on things like texture and light uh, and you might show some signs of life you know, when I did the film of Zumta's Secular Retreat, you I think at one point you see the silhouette of a person in the distance, but you don't really see any people. You do see some cows at the start of the film, but then you see like pairs of shoes left by the front door or signs of life, like signs that a meal's just happened. Or when we did the film about Warmer Yards uh, by Peter Salter, mm. that a lot of that was focusing on little details because there were so many different interesting material joins there. Um, so you can do those those films without people, but if you're, but it does help if you've got a bit of human activity there because film, you know, is a moving image. They are moving images, so you can get that movement from having people in there. And to navigate that, really, I think, I mean, it, it depends on different people's style. For me, really, I, I I try to resist posing people as much as possible, and so a lot of my job, particularly if it's a building that's public or is accessed by the public, a lot of my job is observing how that building gets used and for the first part of the day it might just be a lot of watching and seeing how people move through the space or how they interact with it and then it's about documenting that yeah. as well and you know there's more pragmatic layers to that in terms of gdpr and and how you make sure that you're you're you've got everyone's permission and everybody's yeah. aware that you're there but really in in a sort of more artistic sense it's just about observing and watching things happen and, and then documenting it rather than doing too many shots where you're sort of saying okay can you walk from there to there and now can you get can you go up those stairs and can you do this um it's a um you can do a bit of that but i think if you do too many shots like that it ends up being a bit um, uh, it just looks a bit like you've set the whole thing up what about um films which are not based around a building so for example i know the, the work that you did with pierce taylor for example where it's kind of in a way actually you're discussing more about the life of the practice yeah. um uh, how do you approach a project like like that and how would you how would you work with an architect to kind of capture that kind of story? And again, a similar sort of question: When is the right time to tell that story of the of the practice rather than of a building per se? I think the, I mean, I th in terms of when is the right time to tell the story of the practice, I think it's that's really a, quite a personal question about who's running the practice really or who's making those decisions. Really. Mm. I, think it, I mean, if you think there's a story to be told, or if you've got a big project that's about to come out, or if you've got a practice anniversary if it's your 10th anniversary or something like that, then then that's all good timing if you can tie the film into something else um because obviously a building a film about a building is quite easy the, the, you know you're tying it into the fact the building's finished but a film about a practice it helps if you can sort of tie it back to something like we've just finished the biggest project we've ever done or we just won an award or we just right. uh turned five years old or we're moving into a new office or something like that that helps a lot, but with making that kind of film, it's even more important. Maybe I'm overstating that. It's equally as important to have those meetings beforehand and for, for us to have that conversation because what you're trying to do in that sense is you're trying to get across some sort of philosophy of work um, and, and, what, and what designing buildings means to that person. Yeah. And there can be a lot of kind of um, very sort of textbooky answers to that. And I always try to ask people not to write scripts for themselves because right. it so rarely works um what you're really looking for is there's room to have those more kind of um very sort of pragmatic answers about why you design buildings i design buildings because i studied the bartlett for 10 years and now i kind of have to because i did 10 years <laughs> I don't know. 
Um, but the, the what I'm trying to get is a little bit of um, sorry that that wasn't supposed to be directed specifically at the Bartlett, but um, uh, what I'm trying to get it out of that is something that's more of, of an emotional response. Like what, what you know? So quite often I'll ask questions. We just did a film with Amos Goldreich about his practice. Yeah. I mean, to different people from the practice, and one of the questions I ask them is, is, you know, when did they first, when did they first have an emotional reaction to a building? Mm. When did they first remember going to a building and remembering the building, not like going to the supermarket or going to the swimming pool or something like that? Uh, you know, when was the first time they re re recognised something as architecture and not just as a building that they were being taken to as a child? Uh, what building get yeah where did they get that emotional response to and mm. in the end you, that interview might last 20 30 minutes and you might only use 45 seconds of it but that's kind of the the sort of beauty of film is you have, get to have these sort of quite wide-ranging conversations that you narrow down to something that's a bit um a bit shorter but really what you're trying to get is some kind of emotional mm. sense of why you do what you do and it doesn't have to be some grand emotion you don't have to have tears or waving arms or shouting it just but you just need to show that someone cares basically yeah it, the the post production part obviously is kind of quite a highly curated process of of creating yeah. a beautiful film and our architects notoriously are you know they can they like to be involved in everything that's creative <laughs> or tells the pra tells a story of the practice or is going to represent the practice in you know in a way um how do you work collaboratively with the practice um, in those kind of post-production stages, and how do you keep a you know how do you keep a level of sanity both for yourself and for the and for the practice? Um, you'd have to ask my clients that I think. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the key, I mean, again, it's you know I think sometimes there's a lot of similarities. I think most architects are familiar with commissioning photography, or, um, and there's a lot of similarities between commissioning photography and film um, in the sort of briefing process and the shot setup and things like that. But the, the bigger difference is that film is a bit more involved. You're likely to have more conversations with the person that you're working with, the filmmaker that you're working with. So um, those initial meetings that I've already mentioned are, are really key. And in those initial meetings, I go away afterwards and I write up a kind of storyline, a structured story mm -hmm. um, that normally has like a three act structure, three acts, three or five acts are typical um, storytelling structures for cinema or for non-fiction, fiction cinema, for uh, books, for fiction and non-fiction books, uh, for plays. That's kind of three or five acts is pretty standard. So I try mm. to stick to roughly that kind of setup, beginning, middle, and end. Um, that tries a kind that of to a kind of Sorry. like hero's journey type of archetypal exactly. story. Exactly. Right. There's a great book by a guy called um, John York called Into the Woods, which is a brilliant history of how and why we tell stories to each other. And it's just, it's fantastic. I'd recommend reading that. Um, but yeah, so we I go away after that meeting, I write up this structure and then I send it back to the architects and we have a bit of a back and forth until we sort of go into the, the shoot day with a bit of an idea about what we're trying to do and what we're trying to say. And we go in with a plan. I always say we go in with a plan, but we're prepared for that plan to change because you might turn up and something amazing might happen. I just did a film with, uh, with Pollard Thomas Edwards about uh, um, a third age, uh, third living, sorry, let me start that again. I just did a film with Pollard Thomas Edwards about um, a retirement home, third age home. And we turned up and we had a plan, but it kind of went out the window because we sat down to interview these two residents and they were so amazing and so charismatic that the plan went out the window and we just <laughs> focused on them instead. So we go in with a plan. And then that kind of helps. And then that means in the post-production, we all sort of know roughly what we're aiming for. Um, and then you you just allow time in that post-production to, to have to send a draft copy out mm -hmm. and then to have that meeting afterwards and have a bit of feedback and a bit of conversation. And sometimes the architect will come back with a few comments and some of them you think, oh, yeah, that will really improve the film. And some of them you think, well, actually, you know, I'm going to push back on that a little bit, um, like any creative process. Um, so I think you just have to be a bit prepared for it to be a little bit more involved in photography and a bit more of a collaboration. I know that's a bit of a buzzy word at the moment, but it is a bit more yeah. of a collaboration. It's a bit more of a back and forth 
for sure. More, more kind of dialogue involved. Uh, it, interestingly, you were saying there that you know you might do a sort of thirty-five minute interview with somebody or a long interview with some with with, with a person, and then you're actually only ever using sort of thirty seconds of that clip, yeah. which would suggest then that there's an enormous amount of other footage and i suspect the same is true for lots of the frames and the shots that you might do or panning shots that you know they're loads of beautiful stuff but then they never actually make the final cut is does that then make actually uh you know there's quite a lot of resource or a lot of collateral that you've produced that can be repurposed or sometimes you know you might have four or five different edits if you like from a shoot telling quite different stories and then actually you know the, the architects but the practice has got there's, there's more versatility in a, in a way yeah i think that's the big word versatility um yeah when we when we get back when i say we i mean sophia and i we i run the stevenson and with my partner sophia yeah. um, and her background is in storytelling as well so um when we get back right. we go through all of the footage that we've got we form the rushes which is basically the rushes is every clip you got every bit of food right. you got and then you start planning it out and you start sort of as you know saying oh this clip could go with this one and then you start going through the interviews um but yeah there's loads that doesn't make it if the brief is to make a, a kind of three to five minute building study film for instance there's loads that doesn't make it into there loads of interview footage loads of b-roll b-roll is basically anything that isn't an interview um and you you, you have loads of that but that's that sounds like it would be sort of wasteful but actually it's brilliant because it means it's so versatile so mm. you get this sort of the, the film the core film that you were asked to do and then you can cut a you know a 60 second trailer from it and then you can do a series of like 5 10 15 little 15 second instagram stories or, or tiktok little tiktok clips from it and then you can do uh, you can cut film stills from it you can cut a totally different narrative from it if you want to make one film that's about the material choices and then one film that's about the uh, the end user or one film that's about the context mm. you can make a series of films from the same sort of the same day or the same two days of filming so it becomes a, 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 a far more versatile thing and then if you want to make a film about the practice you've got all this stuff that's you've got all this footage that you've already shot of old projects so you start building up this library similar how you, to you, you would do with photography. And then a lot of websites are running with video footage in the background, so you've got loads of stuff for that. So I, I do sort of, um, although the principal brief tends to be to make a single film, I do kind of try and talk to, to clients about what else they might use the footage for and where else it might go. I, I really like this idea of, um, you know, essentially you're creating a piece of pillar content. Like, you know, you're, you're creating all these rushes, yeah. you're creating, you've got a lot of content there. And then there's, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of ways to repurpose it and use it on different platforms. And it just keeps on giving and giving and giving, which makes it a really valuable in, investment. Um, and obviously with social media nowadays and, and kind of self-directed marketing that you can that you can use and, you know, inter intersplicing that with your own footage off an iPhone as well. If you're doing something on online, um, you know, where where the audience is more forgiving, if you like, uh, it, it, it just means that it's it becomes a really, really good investment to just keep on keep on milking it keep on squeezing it i love what you're saying as well that if, if you're doing it over a period of time and you're building up a kind of um library of video content that when when it comes to do the practice profile story you've got stuff yeah. to to choose from um it's great really interesting it's, it's interesting you're saying about it being a bit more forgiving because obviously you i mean you do a lot of tiktok stuff and it's going that's getting a lot of traction right now and it's it's brilliant it's interesting you know those those sort of what you call the pillar film which is a really nice way of putting it mm -hmm. they're kind of i almost think of them as kind of film festival films like and freak um, mm. frequently they are being used at film festivals a lot there's this growing uh, amazing um uh, scene of people putting together design architecture and design film festivals at the moment and it's really exciting but um so those films are kind of more film festival -y ones and they tend to be quite polished but then off the back of all of that ex all of that footage, some of the footage that's in those films and some of the footage that didn't make it, then you can make these looser cuts as well. Like um, you know, like you said, for for different social media outlets. I know I know it's the open city uh, 
a repurposing a lot of films I made from about three years ago and doing these really nice Instagram stories um, and um, yeah, little, and little videos, vertical format videos for Instagram, which is, is really nice to see them finding a new use for them as well and, and, yeah. re, and getting a second audience for it all. Yeah, abs- absolutely. I mean, I, I, love, I love the fact, you know, on social media, you can take, uh, you know, your kind of landscape format and with a bit of simple trickery, turn it into a vertical format and, you know, recrop it and, and then very simply, you know, put a narrative or a voiceover or something. And it just gives, it gives the film footage a whole new lease of, new lease totally. of life. And it's totally. very, very consumable, very accessible on those sorts of platforms. Um, mm. When you do have a completed film, be it of uh, you know, a practice story or a, like a, a film about a building or a completed project, what are some of the interesting ways that you've seen various practices promote the film? Or get or get eyes onto it. So I guess that's the other that's the other thing because you, you know you go through the investment and the energy of of creating this beautiful film. Then then what? How do we how do we get eyes onto that? I mean that's a big thing. Uh, I think particularly for for smaller practices that perhaps don't have a, a comms person in house or don't employ a, 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 a company or a freelancer to do their comms. We we found it in the past where they've made the investment to make the film, but it's kind of, well, what do we do with it now? Like, where do we put this? The website's not set up to take films. Uh, we'll put it on our YouTube, but we set the YouTube up. You know, the, the practice will say, we, we set, we've set YouTube up to show this film, but it's like, well, you don't have any followers, so no one's going to see it. You know, so you can do all of the, the... I mean, the most obvious thing to do is to push it all through social media, and that is a massive help. And, and then... But also the same destinations that you're using your photography in will take film. Dazeen run a lot of film and get a lot of traction off of their YouTube channel. So they'll, they're, and they're very keen on new content. And so do most of the architecture and design press. Wallpaper run a lot of film work. Um, Icon, Stir World. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I'm just basically listing online media outlets that deal with architecture and design loads of them do the aj have lots of stuff as well um so they're kind of the obvious ones but then the, the sort of the, the, make a thing out of it if you've made a film that you're really proud of and it coincides with you know the opening of a new building or, or a practice anniversary or something invite some clients around and have a screening night and show the film and then have some mm. drinks afterwards make it into a bit of a thing enter it to uh, film festivals because you know with, with the work for instance the work we do with the work I've done with Invisible Studio, the film that we made about Studio in the Woods has been shown in about 15 different countries around the world, like complete mm. coverage of the globe almost in terms of, you know, dotting around the globe. We've had this amazing, um, we've done almost every continent with that film um, wow. and it's a totally different audience as, as well. So, um, yeah, it, it, it's worth having a bit of a plan with for what you'd like mm. to do with with all of this, with the finished film, and then with the other cuts that you can make afterwards, um, and it's, does, it doesn't—it shouldn't be much more complicated than, than what you do with photographs, really. Yeah. Do, do, do you find that actually the filmmaker has some cachet in people wanting to watch the film as well, in the sense of oh, people people know like uh, Jim Stevenson and, the, and and Stevenson and they've they've done another film. I want to go and see their what they've what they've produced. It'd be nice to think so, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I think a little bit. We do. I mean, partly because we've been doing it for probably longer than most people in this country, and there's a, there's a lot. I should say there's yeah. other other filmmakers are available, um, but yeah, we've been doing it for quite a long time. So we do get approached now by uh, media outlets, you know, quite big media outlets, saying, "Have you got any new?" videos coming soon, and we do get approached by film festivals quite often, actually, saying, "You know, we saw yeah. this film." in Mexico and we're doing a film festival in Belgium can we you know have you got anything that we could show so I think it probably has and then obviously you know we've got our own social media followings that are fairly decent well my one is is pretty decent uh, the, the, pra- the one that we set up for the company is brand new so it's building but yeah I, I think it does yeah ha- we certainly can help with that we can help push out a little bit that, that's that you know and I guess that's got that's that's got to be very appealing for a lot of a lot of architects as as well um you know you kind of got the, the named filmmaker if you like behind it or there's there's an additional level of 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 platform or visibility uh for the, yeah. for the work I'm a little reluctant uh, to 
to, to <laughs> I, we, we try and the reason why our, our company is called Steam at Sanand is because we try and push away from this idea that it's this mm. lone genius making all the films because it definitely isn't lone or genius yeah um it's it's always us and somebody so on our website we list we have a list of people that we collaborate with for der- various different things so but but yeah basically i'm trying to get out of saying yeah we can help you push your films and we we're yeah. fairly good at that <laughs> um, love it yeah. love it um, and tell us a little bit more about steven sanand and and how that as a as a venture kind of um opened up and you know you've got again you've got really interesting projects and films and collaborations that you've worked and the films are quite they're they're just they're just beautiful they're beautiful and they're interesting and they they look fantastic in a very unique way of of telling telling the story um how did Steven Sanand emerge and and how does it differ from say the the static photography if you like as a as a service I think there's a lot there's quite a lot of crossovers really I mean quite frequently if I'm if we're out making a film I'll be doing photos as well Um, uh, in fact most of the time I am actually Um, but we did want to the film would become the film would become such a big part of my uh, the offer that I could put out there to clients and Sophia um, I keep pointing behind me she's not actually behind me but that's her desk behind me Sophia will um, was always giving me a lot of feedback and I'd sit down with her you know on draft cut, rough cuts and things and go through it with her and and because her background isn't is more in storytelling and less in in the architecture world she was able yeah. to give a slightly different perspective on everything so uh, it was actually during I mean as many things it was during lockdown we sort of thought this, it doesn't make sense to have these things separate anymore I was looking for a way to to make the whole process a little bit more collaborative so we started Stevenson and as its own entity uh, I mean it's still heavily connected to me as a stills photographer as well but we will work we work with you know Simon James who's a great sound uh, designer and we were working a lot with Nima Murray or we still work a lot with Nima Murray who produces a lot for us um, so it didn't make sense anymore for it just to be my name on it um, so it came about after that and also it encouraged me in sort of busier periods where you know what it's like when you're really busy it's a temptation to put the blinkers on a little bit and just get stuff done but it encouraged me to actually remember that I need other people help with all of these things so I tend to sort of be DOP and cameraman a director of photography and cameraman and then we we bring in other people particularly in the editing process as well um, has this led to you doing kind of independently driven projects so whereby Mm. you've you've got an idea of some buildings that you'd like to tell a story about and then you you kind of initiated uh, projects like that and contacted the architects, or you know, rather than yes. being kind of clients, client based. Um, uh, it has, yeah. It, less so about specific buildings, and more right. about the way that people, either the way people design or the way people uh, work around buildings. So I'm um, mm-hmm. the one of the films that's on the editing uh, notice board at the moment is something we've been working on for a while, actually with a guy called Josh who's a part of Stora who are a parkour team, very famous parkour team. And so he lives in the same block of flats as me, so I see him training a lot and I've been making slowly, very slowly in spare t- in both of our spare times, we've been making a film with him about um his relationship with architecture as a parkour athlete, which is fascinating yeah. actually. Like you know, how he interacts with architecture couldn't be any more different to how you know I do or something like that so it's really interesting and then and then you know with Laura Mark um, we've been making this practice series together where we go in and we we meet with we we choose a practice and we tell and we talk to them about like you know what's unique about their practice and we make a sort of longer like 15 20 minutes thing so we're we're making one on field and fouls at the moment and their idea of low-tech architecture um, and then I do some stuff with Piers Taylor. We did a film with about Sarah Wigglesworth last year, sort of recapping on her career to this day and how she got mm. to this point. So the films that, that are self-initiated tend to be more about uh, a mot- what's your motivation to design or what's your relationship with architecture and less about, you know, a finished building or something like that. Yeah. It, it, are you at a point now where you've actually got quite an extensive back catalogue if you like or library of so much other um of of content that you could kind of 
reuse a lot of that video collateral to tell other interesting stories? And when what kind of permissions do you need to do that if you've been hired from a by an architect to take? I guess it's all your your work, right? Yeah, everything, as with photography, everything remains the copyright of the person that creates it. So in a technical sense, we don't really need to ask permission, but just from, you know, from a moral sense, you know, if, if I was reframing uh, some footage that I'd made of something else to make, to tell a different story, then I would definitely be contacting mm -hmm. the architects and all my clients, whoever they were, to talk to them about using that. Um, we do have this amazing library. I mean, to the right next to me here is a drawer that is full of hard drives and then mm. away from my office is another drawer that's backs up that backs up all of those hard drives so we've got endless 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 stuff that we could use and one day maybe we'll get a chance to sit down and, and make a few little uh uh sort of compilation videos of, of stuff when we have the time to do it but yeah we have it's really interesting when somebody contacts me and says oh that film you made five years ago uh, you know, we were wondering if we could have this clip from it because we need to, we want it for the background of the website, and I have to go back and look at it. And I might oh, I haven't looked at it for five years, and then you're like, oh, I, I can't even remember doing this shot. This is brilliant. I, this is not, not not the shot's brilliant, but it's brilliant looking back on all that stuff. So yeah, it is exciting. We do have this archive, and um, I mean, we have to think about something to do with it eventually. Yeah, you mentioned you're working collaborating with a um, sound designer. Um, yeah. what's what's the role of sound and music in the films and because again this is the a whole dimension that doesn't exist with static photography obviously um, how do you how do you choose the right music how do you choose the right sounds how does how does that process work and again how does it work with in collaboration with the architects that might be something they've never considered before is well what does my building sound like or what does yeah. um, what, what's going to be a soundtrack that would be fitting for for the space, if you like. Yeah, I mean, coming at it from, a, when I started out doing films, coming at it from a, a photography point of view, where I hadn't ever had to consider sound at all, at any point. Mm -hmm. uh, like most architects, or most people who are new to film, haven't really had to consider sound that much. Um, come, it was like a whole world opening up. Film is half of the film, uh, sound is half of the film. If you watch a film mm -hmm. on mute, uh, you if, say you watch a film on mute and then you watch the same film but you turn the screen off but you only hear the sound the version with only the sound is much more enjoyable than the version just with the visuals um so sound is possibly more than 50 percent. it affects everything it like it affects the mood of the film all of the texture so when i work with simon james who's quite a brilliant sound designer who does a lot of you know high profile stuff um he, it's amazing to watch him work. He'll use a whole series of different microphones to record different types of sounds. And a really good example of that, he did. we did a couple of films called Hidden Sounds. Uh, one was about the Macallan distillery by Rogers oh, yeah. um, in Scotland, and one was about Grimshaw's London Bridge train station. And he made these soundscapes out of the sounds of the buildings. And you realise the layering and layering and layering of, of audio that he goes through to get that finished thing. It's not just as simple as holding a mic up in the air and recording the sound of people moving through a space. It's, it's a lot more uh, nuanced and textured than that. And it, it completely affects the mood, completely changes the mood of, um, uh, of the whole film, really. And it's, and then you can add, you know, a voiceover onto that, in which case, you know, it's worth, for, for fairly cheap, you can invest in some uh, equipment that's gonna help you massively with that. And then you add music to that as well. You can license music sort of relatively easily now. Um, and music, again, can completely change the mood. I tend to work sparingly with music because it can be so um, subjective. Yeah. Uh, and even if I do, I still have sound design as part of the film as well. So you still hear ambient sound in the film. I think sometimes people just use music because they didn't get the sound right. So it's just, oh, we'll just put a song over it. And we'll, it comes we'll out. Yeah. It. But ambient sounds really important and it's beautiful to see the layers how they work and how that adds all that texture to it amazing absolutely fascinating um and does the soundtrack then as well get kind of critiqued with the architect how does that how do, yeah, how do you often yeah. find architects responding to like oh hold on what's that sound that's coming out of the the building well, or what's really interesting is what so what um when we do an interview with, with an architect and we interview them in the space, so we're in the in the building with them, the, the, mm. the, the film's about, 
at the end of the interview, we have to ask them to sit in complete silence for 60 seconds because when you're doing a, a when you're doing an interview, you need what's called a wild track or room tone. You need the sound of the room that they've been interviewed in to help you edit things together. So they have to sit there for 60 seconds in complete silence in their own building. And you, when do you ever do that? You never do that, right? When you're and, and then you start realizing, oh, I didn't think I'd be able to hear that, or I can hear the train going past, or I can hear people over there talking in that next room. And just in that little 60 seconds, you start realizing how uh, active sound is in architecture in terms of our response to uh, architecture and how we feel about it. Because obviously mm. architecture is you know, um, a sensory experience. So, and what we're trying to do with film really is use uh, visuals and sound to give the viewer some kind of idea of, of what it's like to be there. We're not really just trying to show them what it looks like, we're trying to give them a feeling of, of what it feels like to be there and sounds massive for that. Yeah. So yeah, we do have a bit of a back and forth with the architects <laughs> afterwards and, and it's, a, it's a, in, re, super, a sound is like, I, I, it's blown my mind over the last few that's, years. That's so it. beautiful, that, you know, and the kind of record a bit of silence, if you like, in the background to be able to yeah. kind of piece things together as a, I can I can totally see that just in the context of, of podcast interviews when we've edited yeah. stuff. I've never ever known that that was a thing people do. Um, yeah, might, might, it's might really important, it, and it's it, yeah, it, it and it helps so much with the editing. It also means that we've got like we've got loads of footage of every interview I've done over the last few years. I've got footage of the architect just sitting there in silence, not knowing <laughs> what to do. And what, that's going to be the film that we make, this super cut of all that these architects. That would be fantastic, like two hours of just architects sitting in silence for a minute each. <laughs> yeah. You know, that would be something that the natural port uh, National Portrait Gallery that would be like <laughs> a big, big screen. Love it. That's, that's, that's really, really interesting, the, the kind of sound design that goes into telling the, telling the story behind the, yeah. the, the, the buildings. Um, in terms of reusing... Uh, videos, and we we're kind of going back to this conversation around versa versatility. Do you f do you find that you you are often invited to revisit films? So a client might start to reuse a film, and then perhaps it was shot a few years later, uh, you know, a few years ago, and they want to um, shoot the shoot the building again, what it's like today, or. Do you ever do things as well where you might be shooting a, a building during different points of the year? That, that kind yeah, of... yeah, it's it's not so common, but it does happen. Yeah, uh, you know, for instance, a phase project, um, you know, where we go in and we'll film phase one, uh, knowing that we're going to go back in eighteen months to do phase two or phase three. Mm -hmm. That happens quite often, um, right? And that gives you know that gives the architect a good uh, bit of sort of interim interim press that they can put out in between. Um, sometimes it's construction phases. Sometimes it's just you know. Uh, you know, uh, we built this school, and you ca you went in when it was all brand new and um, and filmed it. But now we really like it, how it looks now. Now it's been a bit used and a bit lived in, so we'd like to get you back and, and do a bit more. Um, and that's a really interesting thing because what film does with time is really interesting because film obviously compresses time, and mm. well, the editing process in film compresses time. So whereas, I mean, I suppose the equivalent would be would be a before and after photograph set of yeah. photographs but actually film again because it's self-contained you can create this lovely story of of um the, the various lives that the building lives because you know they can be multiple if it carries on depending on how long it lives for you know. would you ever if you had to choose between photography and film could you make a decision or the two so distinctly different nah like it's like today I'm in my office right now and I've been editing photos all day and it's been lovely actually because uh, uh, and I've really enjoyed it and I like the pictures that we've got um, but last week I was just doing film all week and it was great but I, I, I really like the mix a lot part of the reason why I like the mix is because editing film is like headphones on no distractions whereas editing photos I can have music on them uh, or, or brilliant <laughs> Brilliant podcasts by you, of course. Um, of course. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, and, and the mixture, oh, and also like the two inform one another. They're so they're completely intrinsically linked, and mm. a lot of footage that we shoot is really set up like a photograph. Um, we're looking to sort of do that kind of every frame to painting kind of thing with with our with our films a lot of the time. So um, yeah, they're too linked. 
I wouldn't be able to separate the two, I think. The, with the, the filmic aspects um, of, of kind of, uh, of architecture, mm. is there a kind of departure point where you could see yourself moving into um, more narrative or character driven film around architecture? And has that happened or has that been kind of on the cards at any point or is it still very much the kind of documentary style or telling the story of a real life thing? Yeah, I'm not sure if I, it would be interesting to try. I don't know if I've got if we've never done anything that's been about a character like there's been nonfiction. Basically, mm -hmm. we've never done anything nonfiction, and I don't know if we if we would be the, it would have to be a personal project. I think to start off, we'd yeah. have to test it out. I mean, at the moment, we're just really interested in in nonfiction storytelling mm -hmm. and finding ways. Excuse me, and finding ways to tell stories. Um, about buildings and spaces and people's experiences of them. I mean, maybe we'll try it one day, but at the moment we're sort of sticking to nonfiction. Um, be interesting to explore it, but I think that'd have to be something we'd have to give a lot of time to because obviously yeah. fiction is a, is a very different discipline and um, would you know would would be much more involved and in, we'd, we'd probably start working. That that would be something that would happen if we worked collaboratively. I think mm. with somebody else. Brilliant. And what have you got planned for the rest of twenty twenty two? Wow, um, a lot. We've got a lot of stuff going on. Um, hopefully, it looks like we'll be doing the Sterling Price films again with the Architects Journal, which is always a big highlight of our year. We really love doing those because the AJ gives us this brilliant amount of freedom to create the films that we want to make, and mm -hmm. then we get these amazing buildings to work with. Um, we got actually in the film side of things, we've got so much coming up. Laura and I have got a new film coming out. Um, Piers and I are working on something new. Nima and I are going to be working on some stuff. Um, yeah, it's um, it's a lot. Safar and I have just finished this big project for Brighton Festival. We live in Brighton, and we've just finished this massive audio right. visual project for Brighton Festival, which closes at the end of May. Which I don't know when this is going to go out, but we might have missed it. But um, that was a big thing. To be honest, that's taken up all of our headspace for the last couple of months. <laughs> we've got other stuff coming, but right now I'm just trying to finish uh one project at a time but amazing. keep checking amazing love it brilliant well thank you so much jim for sharing those insights into the magic behind architectural filmmaking um and the kind of behind the scenes glimpse of of how these things get put together uh and particularly yeah, i'm just i'm t we're so excited about the, this idea of sound and how sound gets used and the kind of curation of sound when documenting oh. space, it's so, it's so fascinating. It's fascinating. It's brilliant. Thank you for having me as well. My absolute pleasure. Brilliant. Thank you. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.